Good day. This video is going to talk to you a little bit about creating a 3D tracking on top of a video clip. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit play. What I got here, there's a little sign that says, uh, keep calm and don't climb on our walls. And this is using the stock Adobe 3D camera tracker. And uh, it's just a small little 12 second clip. So we're going to step through that process and we'll also stop uh, step through the exporting options for uh, utilizing uh, Adobe CC 2014 and CC 2015 options. So let's go ahead and kick into gear. So first things first, I'm going to uh, zap this back to nothing. So I'm going to delete everything out of here. Now, when I'm getting ready to do this, I'm just going to use a single clip that I have here. I'm going to export it out and then I'll combine it with other clips in Premiere. How come? Um, 3D tracking takes a little while to calculate and if you try and put in something that's too complicated of a clip you could generate errors pretty easily. So a smart route might be to take and if you have something that you want to do some 3D tracking on keep it as a single shot, um, do any sort of compositing that you need to do, export that out and then put that piece into Premiere. So I've got the clip installed. Uh, you can right click on it if you want to do a new comp from selection if you know you're going to use the same size. If you want you can also go into a new composition. Uh, that if you wish. I uh, am a big fan of taking and just with the stock that is a square pixel and yeah it's always going to kind of this is the size that I had set before so I'll just go ahead and say okay with the black background and I drag it down myself. Uh, why? Why Why didn't I just right click? I don't know. It's old school processes. So the first thing that you're going to do is that if you have an interlaced camera image uh, with uppers and lowers, you might want to save yourself some time by doing right click and doing pre-compose. How come? Because if you have an interlaced camera image where you have upper and lower images like this one has separating the upper, um, then you're going to find that it will uh, track both the upper and lower sections. So if you've got um, 300 frames, it will go through and it'll track the upper interlay section, lower interlay sections from the frames. That actually takes, a, yeah, will double your length of time for tracking. But if you go in, right click and do a pre-compose on this one, and I'm going to go ahead and just name this by the default uh, name, it will treat it like a single uh, progressive frames and not interlaced frames, which will save time. Now, Doing the camera tracking is the easy part in uh, since CS6 and uh, CC came about. I'm just going to uh, go to my layer that I got my video on, right click and do this track camera. It'll go through and it'll do the analyzing. And again, the good part about taking and doing a pre-compose is that it will analyze each individual frame. All right. And it, uh, this, since this is a really short video, 12 seconds, it'll do it at a pretty decent click. I'm going to go ahead and pause this recording and I'll come back after the analysis is done. Okay, I lied. Not quite waiting until it's done. But one thing, a couple, uh, uh, actually a couple things to mention. First things first is that when this finishes the analyzing in the background, it's actually going to do a second step where it's going to solve for the 3D motion. And um, if you have a piece of video that does not have a lot of detail in the image, uh, such as if you have something that has too much sky or big empty walls, you're going to find that this solving part will actually not solve at all. It'll actually come up with a big red bar going across that says error. And so you're going to find that the 3D tracking camera is really picky. The smart thing to do is that if you need something in particular, the suggestion is to shoot it, try and make sure that it actually does not generate any errors and that actually solves. When you find that it does solve, you're going to see that that uh, it will put a whole bunch of small little things that look like daisies on the screen. And what these are is these are tracking points that are automatically generated by the 3D camera. Now, if you do not see these tracking points, but it doesn't even give you an error, that actually is because you, you, uh, you have an, enough detail in the image that there's probably at least a tracking point somewhere but not enough really to give you a lot of different options. And when I say different options, I'm going to uh, uh, zoom out on this. We'll do, a, we'll do a whole, put it at about 25%. And you're going to see that, that every time I put my cursor in between a couple of tracking points, it kind of generates this bullseye target. And you're not really able to see the whole bullseye target. I'm going to go ahead and zoom back in to fit in window. And when you're, the important thing about the bullseye target, though, is this. There's actually a triangulation that's going on. And this, if you can see my cursor kind of in the middle, um, that triangulation is happening. That is setting the kind of pin cushions or perspective of whatever you're going to place in, uh, in this particular section. So now to select a perspective point, 
that you're going to shoot from. Um, actually, that one, that one up there looks pretty good too. Uh, you just go ahead and you click with the left mouse button. You're going to see that you'll see your corners. After you left click and select it, you can right click and you can create um, something that will allow you to add a 3D camera in there to track the motion and either text solid, a null, or even a shadow catcher. Um, I usually go for solids because I do some pre-composition and then I add what I want to later. If I go ahead and click solid, boom, then what this is going to do, and I'm going to zoom out so that you can see this a little bit better. I'll zoom out to like 33%. It is going to add a square that is going to cover most of my image. Now the bad part about that square is it's going to be way bigger than I probably actually need. That solid has to be sitting right there. And so smart thing is that uh, if it's way bigger because of, and this is going to be dependent upon your picture, just go into your scale and kind of pull that scale down until you can get it about to the spot that you like it. Now, it is set for the tracking point. And so if I were to go back to fit in the screen so you see this, when the camera, uh, when I uh, move the camera around, you're going to see that that the square is going to follow the, well, bad camera movements. This is this is me using the zoom tool. And uh, what was cool about the 3D tracker is that if the item gets farther away from the camera, the item uh, indeed gets a little bit smaller. So when I say this is not perfect, it is something where you still have to probably do some adjustments. And what are those adjustments? Well, you are dealing with a 3D solid when we took and created. So all you really got to do is play around with your orientation. Uh, if you wanted to have something that kind of fits against the wall, the suggestion is that you kind of turn it and make it so that it kind of looks like it kind of fits against the wall. And that's going to be done on the X, Y, and Z axis. If you need to move it, you do. You can grab the arrows and easily just kind of move it around like that and, and get a decent place for it. I'm going to go ahead and pretend that this is not going to be perfect because I'm going to put some text on it. So I'm not necessarily worried about the corners. The corners could be something that's pretty important if you are definitely dealing with a square sign or something. You also can, if you wanted to, after you get this set down, um, you can still have the not only the ability to play around with the orientation here, but you also have the ability to play around with the effects controls up here in the effect. You can come into the distort and you could play around with corner painting, which still allows you to do even more distortion um, to whatever you place in there to get a little better perspective. So once you get your orientation correct, and uh, and you're thinking, okay, that's looking pretty good. And you click away from it so you kind of get a general idea what it looks like. Then it's not a bad idea to right click on the solid and pre-compose it. Why? We're going to turn it into a layer that we can double click and then do some editing to. And this is the editing that I did a little bit before where I did the uh, keep calm and stay off the walls. Now, it doesn't have to be text at all. I mean, I'm going to type some text in there. In fact, I'll pause and type stuff in. You could easily paste in another picture. The important thing, though, is to note that you do have a composition size. So if you're clicked inside this window and you go to your composition settings, you are looking at, uh, in this case, a, a 1080 by 1080 image. Now, this is going to be based upon the original size of the box that was generated uh, after, the, after I did right-click and add in the camera that is not going to be based upon any of the altered size because right now that altered size is sitting down there at a 10 percent scale so it's a pretty dang small in fact maybe i'll make it just a little bit bigger why not because uh, i can yeah but even when i make it bigger probably now want to play around with some of the yeah i'm not even going to so back in uh, this pre-composition uh, that i made or this composition that's well sucked into uh, the comp one i'm going to go ahead and pause this i'm going to type my words on i'll be right back Okay, I added my text in, keep calm and stay off the walls. Probably would say something a lot more ruder, but eh, such as it goes. So I don't want to keep that blue square on there. So what I'm going to do since these are layers is I'm just going to turn the eyeball off. I could delete the layer if I want, but you never know. Maybe I need to come back and do some mark editing later. I'm going to go into the comp that I see right there and say that, I okay, I got my text on there. And I could do a few more adjustments if I feel the need, which I'm actually going to in a moment. But I'm thinking to myself, I don't like how this sits and if I'm going to do text against a brick wall I don't want it to look so perfect so I'm going to right click and uh, and I'm going to actually go into sorry a little bit higher go into the right click columns and open up modes and I'm going to take this and uh, I'm going to 
turn, change the blending mode on it and that blending mode is just going to do an overlay because that way what I do is I get the colors off of the reflections and I get the shadows. Now if I were to really do this well I'd probably want to do some sort of a displacement edit on it but you know it's going to be this is fine for this. And uh, so a quick little overlay and if I wanted to play around with the distortion on it while that is selected I could just go to effect and I could go to distort, do corner pin, and I could play and maybe pull one of these up just a little bit. Maybe I could pull this down if I wanted to get a little distortion. But I'm thinking to myself, that's just a little bit of adjustment, and I'm pretty happy with, yeah, that's not bad. Okay, and that's playing around with corner pin. And the cool part about that effect is that it will be, it will be locked in for the entire length of the video. Okay, so if you keep it at one spot, then you move all the way toward the end. Uh, you're going to see that it's still going to have the same corner pin. Now, dependent upon your tracking data, though, you might find that especially with with a, a, a zoom and the change of the perspective, because when the zoom in a camera that's going to alter the perspective, that's going to have kind of an effect. And so you might find that in the case here, when I'm zooming out, my, my text actually looks like it's starting to fall over just a little bit, maybe at some point. And uh, and that may ha be happen because of the optics in the lens that could cause this. And that's OK, because what you could do is you could come in and you could still, even with the camera tracking data, you can put a keyframe at one set of orientation. And then you can come out here a little bit farther and you can adjust a different orientation. You could come in and I could drop, uh, I could think to myself, well, OK, this needs to flow back on the X just a little bit more. And maybe maybe not quite so much on the Z. And uh, and so you can do a little bit of an adjustment uh, while it's in uh, while it's in motion. And since that will happen over time, I mean, it's, this is something you may or may not want to do. But this is just because the optics in my in my zoom lens little tweaked. And I can always zoom way in. Let's say if I were to zoom into a 400% value and hold down the space bar and get up to where. Uh, part of that, I'll use the word wall. There's where the wall is sitting. So I got a line going right about through the middle of the wall, and the S is going kind of on that little seam. If I come out here to the end, and uh, or toward the end, and then take a look at the piece, now I might have a little bit of tough time finding out where that window was, but uh, but I see that it looks like the uh, the S is just a little bit farther over. So maybe I might pull this, I could pull it back just a little bit, or you know, it's gonna be far enough away, maybe nobody will even notice. That's the thing, you can overthink this pretty easily. So I'm gonna get back into Fit, and uh, and at, at this stage, I'm going to uh, export it now. So I think I'm pretty dang happy with what I got there. Okay, I'm gonna go into my window, and I'm gonna export out. Oops, actually the auto save almost kicked on. Let me do actually do a save while I'm at it. And I am going to do file and I'm going to do export. Now, there are a couple of different options. So you have the ability to actually send this right to a Premiere Pro project. Don't because it will you'll run into some errors with the uh, camera tracking thing. But there are two options at the top. One is the media encoder queue and one's the render queue. Now, here are some big changes if you've used After Effects in the past. If you add something to the render queue and you're used to being able to come in here and look at the loss list and being able to change it to you know, more of a delivery platform, the answer is no. If you needed to get it to a delivery format such as a MP4, um, you don't have that option anymore. Almost everything that is in the output module of the render queue, and again, that is uh, that's me sitting here going to file, export, render queue. Almost everything that's been added into the render queue, um, or the only things that are left in the render queue, are pretty much uh, lossless formats, you know, good intermediate formats that then you can use and you retain as max quality. If you need something that's a delivery format or you need something smaller, you actually have to go to the Adobe Media Encoder queue, so especially if you need H.264 and you want to render it out as an MP4 file. So you can't use render queue. Uh, you have to go to the Media Encoder, especially if you're in. Uh, it's it, This has been this way since Adobe CC 2014 and Adobe with the latest release CC 2015. So once the media encoder opens, what you're going to see, and I'll slide this window right over here, what you're going to see is that it should add your file right smack dab to this. And if you've never used the media encoder before, the cool part about this is it looks exactly the same since it was first introduced like a decade ago. Um, this it's, It automatically set to H.264 for me because that's what I have. And this looks like all the stuff that you used to see if you've been using After Effects for a little while. I'm going to go ahead and just, since I was already set to h.264 it's already actually going to my desktop probably pretty much 
um, at this point I'm just happy and to get it to start I just hit the green button and that'll start the rendering process the key here to remember though is is uh, why this is being used is it allows you to be background rendering your clips so like let's say you're in the old days when you used to send something to the render queue if if this render queue is running you couldn't use after effects but now what adobe said is that hey we're just going to run everything through the media encoder and while this is still running i can take and i can still use after effects now it will be slow it, you know you're sucking up computer ram resources so it's not going to uh, come into play quite as fast as you may want it to but the cool part about it is that it allows you to open up another project and just kick right into gear or even cooler is that let's say you're taking that video into premiere you could take and just shut down adobe after effects completely and uh, open up premiere why because the media encoder is a completely separate piece of software yeah there you go all right so at this stage that's really about it tell you to have fun on your projects.